Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and today I am pleased to welcome back Tom Worthington from Tam Asset Management and Seafarer Savers. How are you, Tom? I'm good, thank you, Ria. How are you? Good, good. It's a midweek, or it's actually, yeah, it is midweek. It's Wednesday. It's hard nowadays <laughs> to sort of, you know, I think after all the lockdown period, days kind of started blending into one another, so we, we sort of lost the ability to keep track of days on time <laughs> and, well yeah, yeah the little ones help don't they, they keep yes <laughs> they remind you when it's the weekend that's true well mind you i mean for them i that they really celebrated the whole lockdown they were like yay every day saturday woohoo <laughs> yeah so today I wanted to bring you on board to talk about the new normal in the investing world because you know straight across the planet we're talking about not only you know, whether or not you're you're in yachting or you're not in yachting, the fact is the world has changed. Whether or not we like it, whether or not we agree with it, whatever your political opinions may be. And I always say that because I'm on social media constantly and you see all these things that are going across social media. But there is going to be a new normal in the investing world as well. Can you tell us what that future looks like? Um, I would love to try. <laughs> um, obviously, as investors, Looking to the future is a big part of what we try and do. Um, it's well, first off, with what's happened, the markets have changed a lot. There's been a lot of envy and hatred for the last rally. So the markets have gone up over the last kind of four to six weeks quite steadily. But there's been a lot of people hesitant to jump on the bandwagon, if that makes sense, because when we see the downfalls or the you know the the bear markets that where you see the 20 30 percent down you always wonder whether that's going to happen again or whether it's a false rally at the moment the fed uh, in the us is buying a lot of assets so a lot of people are just blindly following what they're doing so that they're not making investment decisions i'm not I'm not talking about investors on their own i'm talking about big houses here they're not necessarily making investment decisions on a more determined basis like they normally would. They'd be more picky and put more research into it because what's happening at the moment is anything the Fed's buying is going up. Because when the Fed buys, um, <laughs> they buy huge amounts. So that may, means it's going to increase its value because there's more demand for it technically in the market. Now, where that puts us is we kind of go well yeah we'll follow the trend a little bit but we're not sure whether we want to follow the whole trend because what's going to set us aside and what people pay fees to time for are us to think about different ways to approach the market and to hopefully beat the market uh, or at least our benchmark um, for their risk category so it's been as james penny our cio uh, our chief investments called it uh, the most hated rally in history um, so yeah, so the new normal is going to be, there's been a lot of talks about ESG, which is what we talked about last time and what I think you touched on with Steph uh, last week, um, with the charities, the social governance, uh, social is going to be one of the big things that comes out of ESG, I think, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement, it's going to be, be more prevalent of how uh, companies approach everyone they employ. Um, how they treat them, what they do for the local communities, what uh, all this kind of thing. I think is going to be a big catalyst towards people moving towards ESG because it's going to make a lot more people aware of the fact that there's options and actually they're better performing at the moment. So do you think that people as a whole, I mean, I know to a certain degree, uh, most people throughout this whole process have realized that there's something that we're doing wrong with our environment and the way we treat humans in general and each other in general do you think that going forward this trend is going to continue within the investment world where they are taking a look and wanting to invest in something just a little bit more socially responsible yeah definitely i think over the next i would have said if you asked me at the start of the year i'd have said over the next 10 years i will probably change that now it's probably over the next five years you will see esg overtake mainstream investments uh, companies that don't appear to be doing anything for either their local communities, environmental or social change, they're going to be pushed to the bottom of the shelf. They're, they're, you know, people aren't going to want to buy those companies the same as they used to. People aren't as ruthless for gains as they used to be. 
at the cost of other people. Um, more and more, you see things on social media pop up saying, you know, I think the one today that I saw was, I'd, I'd rather pay 50 cents extra for my bag of chips than know that the person making those has to have three jobs. Um, and people are becoming more and more aware of it. It's becoming, obviously, media, uh, social media, allows that information to spread better. And I think the investors at the end, so, you know, the, the normal people that invest their pensions, their they say savings, are becoming more aware of it now. Whereas before, it was just like, well, these people over here invest my money and I don't ask any questions. Whereas now, um, actually, the, there's a very boring piece of legislation called MIFID II, which is the governance in Europe um, on how people like us as investment houses address clients and how we, the rules we have to follow and the standards we have to keep. So, for example, MIFID II, the, the, one of the big things they did was if you lose 10% over a quarter, you have to send a letter to the client to tell them. Now, that seems quite normal now, but we, we never have to, used to have to do that. Um, you know, it governs financial advisors, it governs uh, fund houses, it governs a lot of financial aspects of, and insurance as well. Now, what they've done is they're trying to introduce an obligatory question that when a financial advisor is asking a client about their situation is what we call a fact find um, so they, they go through all their personal stuff you know you know how what debts they've got you know car payments mortgages what they've got in the bank what their income is to try and give them the best advice for their their situation they're gonna have to ask and it looks like it might come in by the end of the year uh, what their ESG stance is so they're gonna have to ask that client what do you feel, you know, what is your feelings about ESG? Do you, do you want to um, invest in it or, you know, are you happy to just go mainstream? Now, I'm not sure what the legislation is going to be because it's not been released yet, but I'm hoping it's going to be quite strong because I think it'd be a great thing to happen. Um, but then you've also got the risk of, there's two ways you can ask a question to a client for ESG. You can say, well, would you like ESG? You know, how do you feel about environmental social governance? Or you can say, well, you don't really want ESG, do you? But technically, you've still asked the question. Right. So I'm hoping that there's going to be some guidelines on how you ask the question, which is going to be very arbitrous. But um, it's a good positive step forward for the investment world. Um, you know, it's when you're looking at investing, you've got to, you can't concentrate on one part of investing. It's got to be the whole um, story. You can't focus on, I think I've said this before, you can't focus on one um, single situation, one single charity, you've got to help everyone, that's the only difference you're going to make um, going forward. So it makes sense that they make that same difference with all the clients that they talk to. So it's not just like BlackRock now saying, oh, well, we're going to invest you know, 20 billion into ESG funds over here. Great. But you need to also include the day-to-day -day investors, you know, the mums and dads, the teachers, the, the, the regular people that have all got pensions and uh, savings, they, they put money aside, all those kind of people need to be involved in the choice because that's the only way it will actually move forward. And those people at the moment, a lot of um, the people we talk to, once they're going to gonna have to ask this question, they've not really got an answer. So you go, well, do you want to be ASG? And if the client says yes, you go, um, okay. So we, we, Tam, I'm quite proud to say I have that answer where we can say we've got a very strong now just on the first of this month hit seven year track record so we've been doing this for seven years we're not like a lot of people that have come in in the last year or two because it's become trendy um it's something we've been doing for a long time um we understand it we know it we've got a lot of clients in it and it's something that i'm hoping we can push forward do you think that the average investor is actually waking up and educating themselves as before they didn't? Um, I kind of think it's a natural progression. Um, when we're seeing, again, a lot of social media where they put these things about, you know, billionaires or 90, so 1% of the world own something like 60% of the world's assets, 2% of the richest people in the world own something like 75% of the world's assets. I think it's becoming more of a natural thing for people to just question, well, you know, okay, I'm putting money into this, what's it going to do? Where's the money going? What's it going to be used for? I don't think it's necessarily people looking for investments, because funny enough, we had a group internal meeting and we were Googling 
so we weren't Googling, we were using Google uh, search engine analytics to find out how many people search for ESG investing. And in Spain last year, it was something like 300 people. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's not something that I think people are actively looking for in investments as such as something that's filtering in from other parts of life um, and now being included into their everyday decisions when it becomes when it comes to investing. Well, I mean, one thing that I think the average person isn't aware of is that some of these huge brands that are out there that are sort of jumping on the latest bandwagon, as it were, you know, uh, the environment, whether it be the social conscious, um, you know, when you actually look into these companies, they have their actual, you know, manufacturers in some country where they're paying, you know, child labor 63 cents a day or whatever the figures may be. So with TAM Asset, do you guys go through the entire chain to make sure that any company that falls under your ESG is not taking advantage of anybody throughout the entire supply chain? Because it could be that, you know, this umbrella and then they filter it out here and, it, you know, like any massive company, there's a filter process that goes through so they can have it at, as far away at arm's length as they possibly can. So you were, you know, a regular person couldn't find that. Do you guys do that filtering? Yes, uh, I mean, there's several ways. The main ones are kind of positive and negative screening. Negative screening kind of means, right, they sell alcohol and tobacco and firearms. We're not going to buy them. Positive screening is more where we like to look at. So it's, do they do something for the local community? Okay, they do. Great. What do they do? And then we'll go and look at that. Uh, one of the big funds we hold is um, Bilford and Gifford. Um, they have a very, very good ESG fund. And we buy a lot of their uh, funds as well through, in fact, for the first time in history, our mainstream portfolios have just bought that fund as part of the holdings. So it's not even in the, just in our ESG portfolios anymore. It's actually that good that we're putting it into our mainstream. And that's a big thing. That's, you know, that's never happened. Um, certainly not at TAM. That is the, it, it goes to show how well they're, they're performing and how much our investment team actually think how the value is in the fund. So, you know, for example, one that we got, um, I got an email, a lot of people emailed us requesting to buy funds and we always look at them. Um, one, I'm obviously not gonna name any names, one was a vegan fund. I thought, wait, well, okay, that, you know, if it's got a kind of vegan theme, it will, it might fit our ESG. Uh, well, the top holding was Apple, which has been proved to support low cost child labor in various countries. So, you know, just a pure glance at it within five seconds, we knew we couldn't buy it. So we are very, very selective. I think that we went over this last time as well, there are various shades of green uh, and you can't go too deep green because then it leaves you no options. However, we do try and, you know, if, if we think a fund's good to buy and there's two very similar ones and one, one's more green, but we think the performance is going to be the same, we'll always go for the greener one, the one that's more ethical. But that option isn't always there. Well, I mean, it's really interesting because at the end of the day, you know, you see a lot of people, a lot of people have been stung, to be absolutely honest, when they have been dealing with um, financial planners um, and, and people that supposedly try to help them. Um, and so other people are sort of suggesting do it on your own. But just from this conversation, it's a it's a veritable minefield out there. You really don't know, you know, if something is 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 actually all that it seems because you know, huge corporations are really good at making themselves look pretty um, until you dig. And sometimes even just as a regular person, you don't even have the, the capabilities of doing the kind of digging that needs to be done. No, no I mean, ethical is a, a whole other ball, ball game because it's a lot harder. But even on mainstream investing, if we, if we want to look into a fund, uh, we can contact the fund manager, James, our CEO, or one of our investment team will probably go meet that manager before we actually invest in them. Um, and go through their strategy, look them in the eyes and actually ask, you know, how, how are they going to do that? How do they cherry pick stocks? How do they do this? How do they do that? How do they keep their alpha and the betas lower or higher than the market? How do they go into their commentary? How do they maintain their uh, um, parameters that have been set for the fund or they've set themselves? Now, you, I, I don't want to sound derogatory here, but you as a personal investor, they, they're not going to go and meet you. Um, you know, 
because when we buy a fund, we buy a large portion of it. We talk, we buy millions worth of that fund. So they won't come and sit down with us. They won't pick up the phone to us. A private investor, unfortunately, doesn't have that option um, because these are retail funds for them to buy, but they aren't retail friendly in the way that you can phone up your phone company. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we do all the work on that. The other thing as well, and being as your <laughs> yachting radio, uh, that's really prevalent towards seafarers, is if something like COVID happens and there's a big mass sell-off, there's a dash for cash that we had in March, you might be mid-Atlantic, you might not see that for a week if you're on a smaller boat. You you know, you might be doing night watch, you can't go for your computer and sell, sell your assets that you hold. So having someone professional and a team of people working that for you is really, I mean, we're talking, our fees are 0.25%. So for that amount, it's really not a lot of money to get professionals to do it for you. Now, I've said this lots in the past, and I say to everyone I talk to them about, we're not going to shoot the lights out. We're not going to do anything amazing and make you, you know, double your money in a year or two. But we will. Do, we do have a good track record of making solid returns and a very good track record of not crashing with the markets. Yeah, a lot of markets were 20, 30 percent down. We didn't get close to that. So there's a lot of times where if an investor wants to invest in something, let's call it sexy, uh, and try and double his money in a year, time is not for you. It's not, and I would never pretend it would be. You know, if we make a nice 7% return or something like that in a year on a medium risk, we're quite happy. That for us, we're quite uh, happy with. Uh, obviously, we can't guarantee anything, but we are just a very simple way of keeping your money safe and hopefully growing it for you. And, you know, we're, we're, we're a big team. We've got an office here in New York. We've got an office in London. We've got an office in Mauritius. Uh, we have a big research team in Mauritius, of about 12 people. Now, those are all things that, you know, an individual investor wouldn't have. So it's always something I used to say as a financial advisor as well, weigh up the pros and cons. If you've not got time to do all that, could you, even if you have got time, could you beat the research that, let's say, 20 people team does? You know, people that have been investing, you know, Lester, our CEO, who's the head of our investment committee, has been in this for 40 years. At one stage in his career, he managed to post off his pension in the UK. You know, he, they know what they're doing. So the question is really, is it worth a quarter of a percent? My opinion, very much yes. So, but you know, it depends on what the client wants. Well, I guess at the end of the day, it'd be like taking you and throwing you in the captain's chair and saying, you know, take this a uh, sixty-meter boat out and and uh, do a charter. Uh, that's not going to happen because not only do you not have the qualifications, but you really don't know what you're doing. Um, and I'm assuming you don't know what you're doing. At least. <laughs> not that I assume that you have a captain's license or anything. I mean. If there's anyone watching there that wants to give me a go to 60 minutes, I'm quite happy to try. <laughs> but that's that's sort of the same thing, you know. I mean, it, yeah. you don't have a license, so you're not going to be running out there and and jumping on board and and happening that vessel and being responsible for the people on board. Um, it's the same goes for your finances, you know. If you were so good at doing finances yourself, you wouldn't you wouldn't be worried about it and you wouldn't need the help of somebody else. And it's always good to be able to go to somebody who knows what they're doing, who has a license, who is governed by a governing body, um, because there is a possibility that you could lose your license if you know certain things are not done correctly, right? Oh, oh yeah, hugely. Um, funny enough, when we were getting the Spanish license, so we were regulated in the UK uh, through a London office. Um, we've been passporting into Spain through the UK. One of the reasons we did set up the Spanish office wasn't just for expansion, it was also because with Brexit coming up, which seems to have been left out in the news recently, <laughs> Brexit's still going to happen. Um, we actually got some information, I think it was to the tail end of last week, from an EU speech that it's confirmed that there's not going to, there's very extremely unlikely there's going to be any UK passporting into to Europe. So us having the Spanish license approved by CNMB regulated in Europe doesn't affect any clients that, that, that are resident in Europe or hold European portfolios. Now, that's important because if, you know, let's say it's a captain or an engineer or a stewardess that lives in Mallorca or in Italy or France or whatever. Now, I mentioned MIFID too earlier. 
that governs the whole of Europe. So with our CNMV license, if anything goes wrong or they, they feel that there's, you know, something wrong has been done, they've got somewhere to go. They can go to the Ombudsman, they can complain, and that goes through a European court. Right. Now, you know, there are, I, I won't dig into it, but as you know as well as I do, there has been a lot of people that aren't regulated, and one of the it was uh, that investment awareness uh, talk that we did, uh, God, it must be about nine months ago now. Um, one of the first questions I said was, you know, you need to ask where they're regulated, and about half of the people didn't know what that question meant, which is a little bit scary. I mean, I can't drone on too much about it because it's a world that I've been in all my life. So re to me, saying where are you regulated is like a captain saying what's the flag of the ship. Um, and that's very important. You know, if you're regulated in somewhere that's a bit, let's call it Mickey Mouse, then if you haven't got a complaint, or the money goes missing, or something like that, or the, you know, you feel like you've been mistreated, there's nowhere to really go. You, you know, are you, you going to fly to the Cayman Islands and and go through a court process there for a company that's got a plaque on the wall that they've maybe they've maybe hired a secretary to answer the phone and there's no one actually there. Because that's what a lot of these firms have been doing. Um, in Spain, for instance, they, I was very impressed because they said, right, you know, if you want to apply for the CNMV, they even gave us uh, the requirement to have a minimum of eight square meter office. So they said oh, it can't be just like a little tiny room or a little, um, you know, these shared workspaces. Yeah. You have to have your own office, has to have a separate conference room, has to have separate desks. Uh, and we were very impressed with them. In fact, uh, I mean, when you talk, if you talk to the UK regulator, the FCA, it's usually because you've done something wrong. And the head of the CMV, we sat with them, um, myself, Lester Petch, and Claire Wickett, who's the MD of uh, TAM UK. And he actually said, um, I would quite like you to fly over once or twice a year, we'll have a coffee, and we'll keep you updated with everything that's happened. So it's, you know, we have got that relationship with the regulator, not only um, with the clients, and it's very assuring for our clients to know that you know, we are regulated and it's something that I don't think people think highly enough of, you know, oh, okay, you're regulated. Um, but it is a big, big thing, and especially with the clients in Spain, Spanish regulation, Spanish resident, um, and it's a Spanish company. So it's it's something that, that has recourse if it's done wrong, which means we have to treat customers right. We have to answer the phone. We have to answer emails. We have to give them transparency. We have to be honest. Uh, it's not, nothing new to us. We've, they've been doing it in the UK for years. Uh, even so, if you open a Seafair account, for example, when you get your login, you can see all of your investments. And even if you sell and buy a new fund, we'll put what's called a trade narrative in there. So we'll even tell the client why we've done it. We go, well, we sold this fund because of X, Y, Z, and we bought this fund because of X, Y, Z. So we don't even hide the fact what, what we're doing and how we're doing it. Well, so rather than spend all the time trying to, you know, do the research on, on where to invest, it's probably wiser to spend a little less time doing the research on who you hire to do your investing uh, and then leave it in their hands. That's a very good way to put it, yeah. Um, I mean, we've got a solid team, like I said, all over. Uh, it's me, Lester and Marina here. Um, we are looking for someone new to come on as a junior as well, um, because we're spending quite a lot quicker than we thought. And you know Marina, who is our head of compliance and admin, she's she's come from nine years J.P. Morgan background as well. These are all people that, you know, that we've all we've all been around the block and done it. Even though I am very fresh faced and young, I have been doing this eleven years. <laughs> That's what you said. <laughs> I mean the fresh faced and young thing. Yes, I know you've been doing it for a very very long time, and you're well known within the audit industry. But the rest, well, it's, it's just the lighting in here. It's <laughs> Well, Tom, it actually has been really, really informative. And anybody out there that is considering doing any investment, I would say for sure, get a hold of Tom. Um, you know, ask the questions. So he is more than willing to send you any of the qualifications that he has, uh, any anything that you need in order to check him out. We'll make sure to provide his email address uh, so you can contact him direct, which is always nice to be able to contact somebody direct instead of just the umbrella of the company. Correct, yeah, it is. Thank you, Tom, for coming on board again. We really do appreciate your time. Thank you, and uh, I hope uh, good evening. 
Yes, you as well. Once again, this has been Tom Worthington from TAM Asset Management and Seafarer Savers. We will provide his information as mentioned below this interview when it airs. You have been watching another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I have been your host. Tune in again for another episode.